Yeah, I, I didn't expect that uh, propaganda can, can have such an impact for our minds. I remember communistic time and I thought I was sure that it's, uh, it is, it uh, disappear forever, but it still works. So um, from the other side, I can see that the same propaganda can, can change the, the people identity. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing one of Poland's most acclaimed writers, Olga Tukarczuk. She is the author of several novels, short story collections, and essays. She has been nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature, and in 2018 she was awarded, along with her translator Jennifer Croft, the Man Booker International Prize for her novel Flights, which has also won Poland's highest literary honor, the Nikkei, in 2008. And finally, um, our scheduled moderator, Oskold Melnichuk, ran into some travel delays and is hopefully landing in Boston as we speak. Um, Oskold is a writer, a professor of English, and the MFA graduate program director at UMass Boston. Um, he's a tremendous friend of the series. A few months ago, he was here for Shari Armandanapur's event, and we got to talking, and he asked, you know, who should host here? The writer, the writer Olga Tukarczuk, and, and you know her work. And, in fact, I just received an advanced copy of Flights, and it was sitting on my desk. Um, just a month later, Olga, Jennifer, and Flights received the Man Booker Award, and Askold and I worked together to make sure Boston was a stop on, US, on Olga's US tour. I so wish he was here for tonight's event. Um, we're hoping he still might make it for the Q&A. He did send along a statement about the book, which I'll now read. Uh, these are Askold's words. Some works of art exert such a powerful gravitational pull, they bend reality to their dreams. Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler was one such for me. For the last several days, though, my life has been hijacked by Olga Tukarczuk's masterpiece, Flights. Returning from a book launch in Lviv, Ukraine, a series of delayed flights leading to a missed connection and mounting frustrations came close to erupting into something ugly when a passage in her book abruptly diffused them. Confronting an overbooked flight, the novel's narrator suddenly realizes, I wasn't in a hurry. I never had any particular place to be at any particular time. Let, me, let time watch me, not me, it. Yes, I said, that's wisdom. Just watch me time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I did have somewhere to be. The Brookline Booksmith, Tuesday, September 25th, 7 p.m., for a conversation with Olga, whom I'd met in Kiev through our mutual friend, the extraordinary novelist and public in intellectual Oksana Zabushko. Each of my pilgrimages, writes Tukarchuk, aims at another pilgrim. And in this case, mine was Olga. The, world, the word pilgrim is resonant, as technically it describes a traveler to a holy place. Because while flights might appear as a peon to travel and the self-delighting dynamism of motion, my energy derives from movement, notes Tukarchuk, it is so very much more than that. Her mosaic of multiple narratives memorializes earthly delights and unearthly yet all too human horrors. A chance encounter at an airport with a stranger inspires the ominous response, they say you have to sacrifice some living being when you build an airport to ward off catastrophe. Episodes chronicling the casual cruelties of animal taxidermy culminate in the horrifying, bizarre, and alas, true story of Solomon, an enslaved Nigerian man whose natural gifts enabled him to marry a general's daughter and eventually elevated him to the post of tutor and chief servant to the Prince of Vienna, as well as making him head of the powerful Masonic Lodge where he frequently crossed paths with Mozart, among others. At his death, he was skinned, stuffed, and turned into an exhibit at the Imperial Natural History Collections. Solomon's own daughter's letters to the emperor begging for the return of his body are among the most poignant documents you will ever read. The genius of Tukarchuk's astonishing book is that while many of these episodes appear and to a degree are self-contained, the cumulative force and thematic development lead to moments of exhilarating revelation often delivered in the span of a few sentences. The theme of holiness recurs in various guises. She writes, he who rules the world has no power over movement and knows that our body in motion is holy and only then can you escape him once you've taken off. That is why tyrants of all stripes have such deep-seated hatred for nomads. This is why they persecute the, persecute the gypsies and the Jews and why they force all free people to settle, assigning them the addresses they serve as their sentences. What they want is to create a frozen order, to build a big machine where every creature will be forced to take its place and carry out false actions. Institutions and offices, 
stamps, newsletters, a hierarchy and ranks, degrees, applications and rejections, passports, numbers, cards, election results, sales, and amassing points, collecting. Move. Get going. Blessed is he who leaves. <laughs> it is better to stay silent or to say something better than silence, observed the austere Pythagoras, to which Tukerchuk shouts, speak, speak, because the strongest muscle in the body is the tongue. Like a tree, a great work of art doesn't necessarily want to help you, but like a tree, by its nature, it helps you to breathe. Thanks to Oskold for that exquisite introduction to flights. Please join me in welcoming Olga and Jennifer. I'm actually going to start with a section alluded to by Oskold's introduction, which is the tongue is the strongest muscle. So these are two very different pieces. Each is one page. Uh, actually, this one is contained, and the next one is the start of the title story of the book. Um, the microphone, OK? Yeah. All right. The tongue is the strongest muscle. There are countries out there where people speak English, but not like us. We have our own languages hidden in our carry-on luggage, in our cosmetics bags, only ever using English when we travel, and then only in foreign countries to foreign people. It's hard to imagine, but English is their real language. Oftentimes, their only language. They don't have anything to fall back on or to turn to in moments of doubt. How lost they must feel in the world where all instructions, all the lyrics of all the stupidest possible songs, all the menus, all the excruciating pamphlets and brochures, even the buttons in the elevator are in their private language. They may be understood by anyone at any moment, whenever they open their mouths. They must have to write things down in special codes. Wherever they are, people have unlimited access to them, they are accessible to everyone and everything. I heard there are plans in the works to get them some little language of their own, one of those dead ones no one else is using anyway, just so that for once they could have something just for themselves. The next one I chose because it has to do with the title um, and why I translated the title the way I did, which is somewhat unexpected because it isn't what the Polish word means, which I'm sure we'll get to in the questions. All right, flights. Over the world at night, hell rises. The first thing that happens is it disfigures space. It makes everything more cramped and more massive and unscalable. Details disappear and objects lose their features, becoming squat and indistinct. How strange that by day they may be spoken of as beautiful or useful. Now they look like shapeless bodies, hard to guess what they'd be for. Everything is hypothetical in hell. All that daytime heterogeneity of form, the presence of colors, shades, reveals itself to be utterly in vain. What purpose could possibly be served by beige upholstery, by floral wallpaper, by tassels? What difference does green make to a dress slung over the back of a chair? It's difficult to understand the covetous gaze that fell upon it as it clung to its hanger in the shop window. There are no buttons or hooks or clasps now. Fingers in the dark find only vague bulges rough patches, lumps of hard matter. The next thing hell does is drag you out of sleep. You can kick and scream, hell is implacable. Sometimes it provides disturbing images, frightening or mocking. A decapitated head, a beloved body covered in blood, human bones and ashes. Yes, yes, hell likes to shock. But more often than not, it awakes without standing on ceremony. Your eyes open onto darkness, launching a stream of consciousness. Your gaze aimed at nothing is its advance guard. 
The nocturnal brain is a Penelope, unraveling the cloth of meaning diligently woven during the day. Sometimes it's a single thread, sometimes more. Complex designs break down into prime factors, warp and weft. Weft falls by the wayside, and only straight parallel lines remain, the barcode of the world. Then you realize, night gives the world back its natural, original appearance, without sugarcoating it. Day is a flight of fancy, light a slight exception, an oversight, a disruption of the order. The world, in fact, is dark, almost black, motionless and cold. So that's all I'm going to read for now, unless anyone has any special requests. Um, and we can turn to some questions with Shuchi. So I, I want to talk about the, the beginning of this book, um, which it was published 10 years ago. Um, and 10 years ago was a very different time. Um, exactly. Yeah, so, um, you know, 10, 10 years later, um, if you were to sort of, you know, and Askold, he, he phrased this so well, um, which so much of this book is about the virtues of motion, um, but given what we're kind of seeing right now with this, with this forced movement, this forced migration, um, would you sort of alter or change any of, of the ideas that your narrator kind of, kind of thinks about? Mm -hmm. For sure, we are living in a different reality than 12 years ago, because for me, this book is 12 years old, because it w it was the process of writing, it was uh, more or less uh, between 2004, 2006. And at the time, I had a kind of a very special moment in my life. I realized that, um, yeah, perhaps it, it's too personal. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I realized that it. I have to change something. This is very um, obvious when you pass for your forties. Mm -hmm. That this is uh, the 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 sign of the perhaps crisis or something like that. And I decided having a passport, which is not so obvious for us from Central Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at that time we had our passports, Poland was a part of European Union and the borders were open for us. So I decided to just go and travel as far as it is possible. And uh, then I inv I desperately wanted to, to write about my tra traveling, but I desperately looking was looking for a form how to put in, in, into words my entire experience of traveling. And of course, I had a classical form of such a memoirs of from, mm. from traveling. Uh, reportage is another classical form. And, uh, but everything was not su suitable for my experience. So I thought that mm, traveling is not just a uh, uh, and it is not just traveling on the ground anymore. It is ra rather jumping from one point to the other. It is like a zipping on the on with pilot on the with television, changing a channel all the time. And yesterday, no, today in the morning I was in Washington D.C. Yeah. Today I am in Boston. So this is a kind of jumping. Mm -hmm. So this book is devoted to this feeling, uh, the, the traveling as a jumping, the traveling as a very quick change, mm -hmm. changes, um, and the trying to, um, um, to collect and, and all those small detailed experiences into one pattern. Mm -hmm. So um, I invented, this constellation novel, as I used to say about this, it, perhaps it sounds funny, mm -hmm. but my first uh, image was a kind of metaphor. When you are staying on the porch during the night and you are looking above and then you can see the, the sky full of bright points and you can, you, you, you can see those, those uh, stars. And in fact, this is a chaotic order, but our brain, our mind, 
perceiving this chaotic order in a kind of shapes, in a constellation. And behind those constellations, there is an entire tradition of our civilization, of our culture. So the, the s mythological stories, um, meanings, senses, and so on. So this book was uh, designed as a constellation full of small uh, spots, writing spots, like small text. And it is just dedicated to you, to the reader, mm -hmm. to do something with your mind, with entire collection of those spots. Uh, yeah, but what was your question? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you answered it beautifully. Um, I, you know, I, th I think that's so right with some of the reviews I've read. Um, and even I felt that everybody, you know, your reading experience of it is very different, right? Mm -hmm. So there's sort of no way to really view. And I even think trying to summarize this book is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you I, I, I read that you you kind of stood up above all the pages and looked down upon them mm -hmm. and sort of and sort of looked that way. So with these jumping stories, is there any kind of thread? Because you do drop a story and then pick it back up. Is there any kind of one story or character, and I'm asking Jennifer as well, um, that that really kind of um, stuck with you or that you, you kind of regretted leaving? Yeah, for sure there are many deeper senses. Mm, uh, from my point of view, when I uh, designed this book, so for me, there, were, there are two main plots in this book. One is the mm, traveling, and the other one is uh the vehicle which is the mm, like a, a carriage not the carry um the a c chariots which are you know taking us to uh, with the tra to the travel trap to the traveling so the, the human body is such a vehicle very fragile mortal uh weak in fact and the desperation in human uh, behaving to pres pres to to preserve those human body uh, from cosmetic medicine till the preservation of mummies somewhere in the ancient mm -hmm. Egypt. Uh, so this uh, miracle of uh, preservation of something which is so fragile is the 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 other plot. Uh, in this book. So they are weaving each other all the time. Mm. And of course, it is the writing this book is w a little bit like a uh, design of clothes. If you have a nice jacket and you like this jacket because it, it's uh, very comfortable, so it means that it is well done. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. somebody who is buying this jacket, it is not uh, he or she uh doesn't need to know all those uh you know form how it was designed mm -hmm. it should work mm -hmm. so it should work so that was my idea so i'm very happy to to um, read in reviews that this book can be perceived from from so many points of view and every single reviews was dif different mm -hmm. as you said mm -hmm. because it only um shows that this book can be like a this Rorschach test, you know this, this, yeah. So you you can in a way project your own uh, interest into it. Mm -hmm. That's the great praise for me. Oh, good, good. Um, and Jennifer, was there a particular part of this book that you um, that you love trans? I mean, translating this must it must have been quite a feat. And <laughs> aside from the fact that it is that is long and the stories are jumping. Not as much of a feat as getting this microphone free. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good? I'll just get borrow. That. Okay. <laughs> borrow Olga. She doesn't need to talk anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's in English now, so. Um, yeah, I really connected with, first I really connected with the more traditional narrative. So I, when I first started working on this wonderful book, it was 2008, and I started with, there's a triptych, called Kunitsky, which is about a man who uh, loses, inexplicably loses his wife and child on vacation in Croatia. And I started with that story. So that's something that occurs in three different places over the course of the novel of flights. 
Um, and that really moved me, and I published each of those pieces in different magazines. Um, and then there were other longer stories that had similar effects on me. So I translated a story called God Zone and immediately started weeping as soon as I finished the translation, which was something that had never happened to me before. Um, I'm not a big like movie crier even or like reading crier, but it just really hit me very hard. Um, and then I started working on these more anecdotal sections or the more kind of capsule philosophy sections which are also so compelling and so entertaining at the same time, so accessible and inviting, um, which is kind of a signature of Olga's, while also being so thought-provoking um, and fascinating. So, and as she says, there is this, there are two kind of continuous threads that link all of the things in the novel, and you can, you can sort of embellish as you wish, this jacket, or however you want to think of the book. Um, but but there are always these things linking, linking the pieces together, linking the parts together. And her language also does a wonderful job of carrying that along her prose, which is very lyrical um, and almost rhythmic, really supports this um, otherwise somewhat unusual structure. And so I have one more question for you, Jennifer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, well, so you translated this shortly after it was it was published um, in Polish, but it only just um, was translated, was officially published in, in the English last year. Is that right? Fitzcarraldo um, in the UK right. published it last year. Um, so, and you had been trying for a while to get the book published. So why do you think now? Why do you think, you know, 10 years later, um, it's found its way to an English language audience? Yeah, I find these things so interesting because when we think of a literary canon, things seem so obvious to us, but they're actually so haphazard as they're unfolding before our eyes, especially if we're very close to them. Um, so it's totally unpredictable to me what books I try to sell are going to instantly meet with editorial approval. This one, like I say, I was publishing excerpts and getting grants, and people were afraid of it. They liked it. I mean, there was not a single editor that said, this book is crap, we're definitely not doing it, of course. But everyone felt like it was a little bit too risky and it might not sell because people don't might not know what to make of it because they might not recognize it as a novel, but it's not a collection of short stories, but it's not nonfiction. Um, and so I think a couple of things happened. One is just that we got really lucky um, that a guy named Jacques Testard started this um, Fitzcarraldo publishing house in the UK, um, which was open to a particular kind of experimentation just a very kind of niche thing that Olga fit perfectly into. Um, and then the other thing is that being in London, Jacques became very aware of the plight, for lack of a better word, of Polish immigrants um, who were being bullied and maligned um, in Great Britain. And he was kind of th happened to be at that moment thinking of publishing a Polish book. And then he remembered that I had sent him Olga's book. Um, so it just kind of worked out that way. It, yeah, it's hard to like justify any of this, but that's what happened. Wow. But may I add yes, something? Yes, of course. I think that we are living in the time of crisis of uh, realistic novel, mm -hmm. because the realism, which uh, was so important for uh, building uh, liberal and democratic society doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, no such a in, in terms to describe our experience in realistic terms. We need an, another uh, terms of uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. Just um, we we have to, in a way, trust transcend this realistic way of telling stories because they are not enough now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, that, that makes me think of magical realism and... Uh, yeah, you know. but magical realism is also something from the past. From the yeah. past, yeah. right. And, and I think what's starting, we're seeing now with a lot of um, 
works in the US, this, this term autofiction. Um, so at least there is, even if that is more realistic, there is sort of a melding of genres, which mm -hmm. is new, because there's always been a very sure. sort of strict mm -hmm. divide between, between genres. Mm -hmm. So I, I always thought about American literature as a, as a, um, a symbol or mm, just a nest of realistic uh, novel. But now, after the success of Lincoln in Bardo, <laughs> of Bob Sanders, yeah. it's so similar to Polish uh, uh, Jade by Adam Mickiewicz. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of trying to really to try to find an, a new way of exp exp uh, expressing expressing what we are uh, thinking about, what's going on around us. Mm -hmm. So it's very, I think that we are living in a very interesting times. I don't know I if it is good or bad, but anyway. It's making us think differently. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sorry, I'll yeah. just say that Jade is um, forefathers Eve, but it's, I don't believe that anything is untranslatable, but mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> And so you you run a literature festival at your home, is that right? So um, yeah. and this is this is uh, something Askold has, has passed along. So um, in Noah Ruda, which is where you live, um, and Slesvig, you've lived there for about twenty years. Is that is that right? In that? Yeah, I bought this house uh, in nineteen ninety three, and this is the the novel devoted to this place called House of Day, House of Night, yeah. translated al also into English many years ago. And I feel very attached to this place. Uh, this is even if it is not my my family place. I bought this house. I came from outside there, but I like it very much. And if you would like, I can tell more about this place because yeah, it's very value for me. But you right, uh, we fix, we establish such a small festival, and this is literary festival and Oksana Zabushko was a guest this year mm -hmm. so I think that that was the reason that Askold know about this festival because it is small and local festival I do believe in such a local things mm -hmm. they are really very powerful especially in this political situation in Poland when tho those big governmental uh, you know culture project are completely crazy mm -hmm. so only in locality we can trust <laughs> and so, and I would I actually love to hear about the house and, and the area that you live in, in in Poland, and if you've seen a shift in there as well, um, especially recently with with, with the migrations happening. Um, Askold said he he had heard that um, a lot of people are actually leaving parts of of Poland. Um, it, the liberals especially are leaving. So I don't know if you have anything to say. Askold knows a little bit more than I do about that, but. Um, I wouldn't home. say that people are leaving Poland uh, because of political situation just now but the, the, that's true that in th we had a very s very strong and big wave of economical um, immigra uh, immigration like four five six years ago um, but you have to know that the place where I used to live in Poland this is the western part of Poland which um, especially this this small place where I live. Never belonged to Poland before the Second War. We gained this piece of land after the Yalta commitment. Uh, and it was before German, Czech, Habsburgian. This is the quintessence of the Central European history. So in fact, we are all emigrants there. We are everybody living there came uh, personally or our fathers and ancestors came on this place so most th the big part of Polish society are uh, emigrants from somewhere especially I belong to such a family that we were move out from the eastern part of Poland to the western part and uh, had to root uh, root, uh, um, yeah, from, for for the rest for the next generation there. So, I so this is a, for me very painful. Why? Um, because of the our go Polish government refused to, mm, to 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 invite refugees from Syria uh, recently. It was uh, crazy, and uh, I, I don't understand it. 
And, and you've and you've spoken out about the government a little bit and have, have had to deal deal a little bit with that. Um, I know the Book of Jacob as well, which you're translating. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about that book? Because I know I, it, we, it's not translated yet, but um, I think it, it's so different in sort of in the subject matter. Um, and I think it kind of speaks to your range. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that if you want to both speak about it. Sure. I'll just um, say something about Olga's range, which is along with the, that very lyrical prose 